Thanks. I actually also added the word optimization because uh, talk ended up being uh, um, a lot focused on uh, intersection of learning and optimization. Um, so anyway, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, so this talk is actually based on uh, several works, uh, some of them together with my student Yossi El Giovanni, uh, as well as works with Nati Srebo and Tong Zhang. So uh, when we talk about distributed learning and optimization, we're talking about a situation where we want to do some standard learning or optimization task, but where the data is uh, partitioned across several machines. And this could be, uh, this can come in various uh, ways. So it can be, you know, starting from having several cores on the same CPU through uh, several nodes in some uh, uh, cluster and up to some uh, a huge uh, computing grid with different machines, maybe at different uh, parts of the world. Um, so distributed learning and optimization is something that uh, has become very popular in recent years. And there are two main reasons why we uh, want to consider this setting. Uh, so one of them is uh, when we have lots of data. So as we all know, we live in the era of big data. And sometimes the data is so large that we cannot fit it in a single machine. So we need to distribute the data across several machines and uh, do the learning based on that. So this is sort of viewing distributed, the distributed setting as a constraint. Uh, but another situation where it's actually distributed as an opportunity is um, when you know, we don't have one machine, we have k machines. So hopefully, we'll be able to solve the problem k times uh, faster. Um, and there are several challenges when we want to do uh, learning and optimization in a distributed uh, setting. Uh, the first one is the issue of communication. So no matter which of the uh, scenarios we're talking about, whether it's uh, cores on the same CPU or a geographically distributed computing grid, communication is always something which is much, much slower than local uh, processing. It takes much more time to send data between machines compared to uh, each machine doing something uh, locally on its own uh, data. Usually this is in orders of magnitude difference. So generally we want algorithms which are distributed, which communicate, but actually communicate as little as possible because it's expensive. The second challenge is how do we parallelize the computation? And the challenge here is that many standard uh, learning and optimization algorithms are very inherently sequential in nature. So if we look, for instance, on uh, stochastic gradient descent, this is based on very sequentially taking an example, doing some update, then another example, then another update. And a priori, it's not clear how we take such a kind of an algorithm and make it work in parallel. The third challenge is that we want the result to be accurate. So uh, obviously, we don't want to suffer because we distributed the computation, so the output quality should resemble what we could get with a non-distributed algorithm. Um, so um, there are many ways to, uh, um, uh, uh, to uh, formalize uh, this setting. The setting that we're going to focus on is uh, when we want to do something uh, akin to empirical risk minimization, uh, and when the uh, function that we want to optimize is convex. So we basically want to minimize some function f, which we can write as an average of fi's. Each of these fi's represent the average loss on a, a one of the machines, and we want to minimize the average. Um, and each machine in turn has n uh, data points. So for simplicity, we're assuming each machine has the same number of examples, but everything I say can be easily generalized. Um, and uh, the functions are generally convex. We can talk about situation Similar to non-distributed optimization, we can uh, divide this to scenarios where uh, the functions are maybe uh, strongly convex or smooth or both. Uh, and we'll discuss each of these scenarios later on. And in terms of the communication, we generally assume that uh, communication takes place in communication rounds where machines can broadcast to each other. And the amount of communication corresponds to sending order of d bits uh, per machine per round where d is a dimension. So the idea is that the machines can send to each other, um, to each other uh, maybe uh, vectors or gradients, but uh, not uh, things like uh, Hessians, for instance, d by d matrices. And this corresponds to a, 
uh, you know, big data, high dimensional learning scenario where D can be very large and sending, say, D by D matrices is not something uh, which is feasible. Uh, and the main question in this setting is how can we sort of optimally trade off between these uh, three requirements? How do we get an accurate solution with as little communication as possible and with uh, as little runtime as possible, ideally getting uh, speed ups by a uh, parallelization? Um, and notice that in this talk, uh, when we're talking about accuracy, I'm going to focus on optimization error. So our goal is to minimize uh, the this empirical risk function. Uh, you can also talk about uh, other uh, goals. So for instance, you can assume that the data is sampled IID from some distribution and your goal is to minimize the expected loss or the risk. Um, and that uh, sort of puts things in a slightly different perspective. Um, again, there are many ways and many settings one can talk about here, but this is the setting I will focus on, okay? Okay. So, um, starting to make things a bit more concrete, um, so in order to discuss the different results, we need to make various assumptions on how the data was distributed to the machines in the first place. What can we say about the relation between them? Um, so one uh, scenario is when we don't assume anything. So um, the data was uh, uh, partitioned in some arbitrary way. Maybe one machine has the positive examples, another machine has the negative examples. Um, this is one setting. Uh, at the other extreme, um, we may assume that the data was actually partitioned at random. So we had a bunch of data points that were just assigned uniformly at random uh, to the machines. And then the situation um, from the algorithm uh, designer perspective um, is potentially improved because now there are strong re relationships between the data across machines. So for instance, we have various concentration of measure effects, the values or the gradients of the local functions that each mach machine are related. And as we'll see later, this is something that we can utilize. Uh, another setting that uh, is interesting to talk about, which in some sense generalizes the previous two, uh, is a delta related setting where we assume that um, there are relationships between the values or the gradients of uh, the local functions at uh, any point. Um, so again, if the data is uh, uh, partitioned uh, at random, um, you really have this kind of uh, situation where delta is uh, uh, pretty small. But you can also uh, discuss here more general things. So maybe there are statistical similarities between the data points, but maybe it wasn't exactly partitioned at random. So in some sense, it lies between the arbitrary and random partition scenarios. Uh, so basically what we're going to do in this talk is to discuss each of these uh, three scenarios and uh, discuss both uh, upper and uh, lower bounds, mainly in terms of the amount of communication. Um, I also discuss uh, um, uh, the runtime though. And uh, uh, regarding the random partition, um, so um, it, the results there are actually uh, going to rely on some very new results, which might be of independent interest actually, uh, having to do with without replacement sampling in stochastic gradient methods. So I'll talk about uh, that, but also point out how it gives uh, something new for uh, distributed learning with random partition. Okay, so let's start with the arbitrary partition scenario. So uh, we don't assume anything about uh, what's the relationship between the uh, functions of the different machines. And maybe the simplest baseline here that one can think of is just to reduce it to standard first order non-distributed optimization. So we can sort of ignore the fact that we are in a, a distributed scenario where this f uh, is an average of functions of different machines. Um, and we can just have each machine compute gradients of this uh, capital F. This requires one communication round. So each machine computes uh, the gradient of the local function, then they do a communication round to average. Um, and that gives us basically an oracle to compute gradients of a uh, big F. And now we can plug it into any kind of black box uh, first order uh, algorithm, for instance, gradient descent. Um, and then you get an algorithm where the number of communication rounds is the same as the number of iterations of this algorithm. 
So you can do gradient descent, you can also do all of the other things that people do in <coughs> standard optimization, you can do accelerated gradient descent, you can do smoothing, uh, and so on. And that gives you upper bounds on uh, the number of communication rounds you would need. So if the functions, local functions are strongly convex and smooth, uh, you get the number of um, communication rounds were scaled like square root of the condition number uh, or 1 over lambda if the functions are lambda strongly convex and smooth. Uh, I can also talk about just uh, non-smooth but lambda strongly convex, convex and so on. You just derive it from the standard upper bounds for uh, uh, these algorithms. Um, and uh, on one hand, the, this is a very nice and simple approach. It's also almost fully parallelizable because most of the time each machine just computes uh, the gradient of its own local function, but it does require a relatively large number of communication rounds. So when we do um, a large scale uh, learning, uh, so this problem is in high dimensions, the lambda usually comes from an explicit regularization that we add to the problem, and it, uh, for statistical learning considerations, usually it's quite small. It actually decays with the amount of data that you have, so lambda is generally quite small, and then you may need to do many communication rounds, or maybe also depending on uh, uh, epsilon, where epsilon is a desired accuracy. Um, now, so of course, yes? Uh, just to be clear, so mm -hmm. you, everything is fully synchronized, like you, your communication rounds yes. is like yes. in one shot? And yes, it's a very simple, naive, simple baseline that you can always do. Um, now, of course, uh, as you uh, might suspect, there are probably more sophisticated things you can do, and there actually have been a lot of work in recent years uh, on algorithms uh, for such a, a situation, you know, from ADMM, COCO, COCO Plus, many others. Um, but at least in, in the worst case, do they actually improve on this simple baseline? And the answer, maybe surprisingly, is uh, no. So again, at least in the worst case, over say all strongly convex and smooth functions, you can't get something better in terms of the number of communication rounds, at least for a very, very large family of um, algorithms. Uh, so basically, these are algorithms which fall into the following uh, template. Um, so each machine implicitly has some kind of uh, set of vectors wj. And what the machine can uh, do between communication rounds is um, uh, sequentially compute vectors which are um, basically either linear combinations of the vectors it computed so far or gradients of the local function at that point or even things like uh, multiplying the points with Hessians um, and actually it, the point it doesn't even have to be that the point it computes is in the span of these things it can be also a linear combination of uh, the point in its gradient. So for instance, that allows us to also consider algorithms which solve some kind of local optimization problem uh, at each iteration. Uh, and the machines can actually do this uh, for, as for as long as they want in terms of uh, the lower bound that I'm going to show. Um, and uh, during communication round, they can basically share some of the vectors they have uh, computed. Okay? So I don't know if it covers every possible imaginable uh, algorithm for this problem, but it does uh, cover the kind of reasonable approaches that at least I can think of. Mm -hmm. Yes? Why do you need like gamma and u to be positive? Yeah, this is just for technical reasons. So the point is that uh, if the gamma is negative, it means that you may be able to solve a local, at every round, local optimization problems which are non-convex. And this is actually something that would break uh, the lower bound, but it's also, uh, you know, if you limit yourselves to um, algorithms which are based on convex optimization, um, then you basically have uh, these uh, uh, factors which are positive. So you need gamma and u to have the same sign, that's it? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll show you the uh, proof idea. It's actually very simple. I'm going to focus on the case where we just have two machines. Um, and the local function of this machine will be just a quadratic function. Uh, only one of them will have a linear term, where E1 is the first uh, standard unit vector. 
And A1 and A2 are uh, two matrices which have the following form. So it's sort of, um, they are block diagonal where the blocks are uh, overlapping. So what's the idea? So let's consider the first machine uh, before any communication was done. Uh, so because of the bias term, it would be able to compute a vector with a non-zero in the first coordinate. But then with, before communicating, it won't be able to manufacture any vectors with uh, um, non-zero values except in the first uh, coordinate. Um, once the uh, communication round uh, happens, the machine will be able to make the second coordinate, actually even the third coordinate, non-zero. But again, it would get stuck. Uh, again, because of the structure of, this, uh, of these, um, of these uh, matrices, so basically, the number of communication rounds limit how many coordinates uh, we can make uh, non-zero in the uh, vectors that the machines compute. But the optimum of uh, this uh, problem uh, actually um, uh, requires all coordinates to be uh, non-zero. And if only uh, the first few coordinates are non-zero, that gives us a lower bound on the, um, on the error. So after t iterations, the error can be no less than exponential in minus t over square root of 1 over lambda. Uh, and that basically gives the lower bound for the strongly convex and smooth case. Uh, as some of you might recognize, if you look at how the global function looks like, the average of f1 and f2, this is essentially the kind of hard function that's uh, been used to prove lower bounds for a first order uh, algorithms in a non-distributed optimization scenario. Uh, so um, uh, construction is uh, the same, but here we actually make different structural assumptions. So again, as I said in the previous slides, the machines can compute uh, the local Hessians and multiply it with things, that's fine, and still the lower bound would hold. Uh, you can also do similar things to get results for, say, non-smooth functions. Uh, the basic idea is still the same, but the construction is different. So uh, without smoothness, we uh, again create two functions with this kind of interlocking uh, structure, but now it's not a quadratic form, it's with absolute values. Um, and we get a, a, a 1 over lambda t squared uh, lower bound, which is matched if you do the simple baseline I talked about, uh, specifically with accelerated gradient descent and with proximal smoothing. Um, okay, any questions about uh, this? Okay. Uh, so next, uh, we'll have to discuss the delta-related uh, uh, setting, which, as I said, is a situation where we assume, again, I'm not going to assume that the data was necessarily partitioned at uh, random, but still, I will assume that the functions have similar values or gradients or Hessians um, at any point in the uh, domain. Um, and uh, you can actually give uh, lower bounds very similar to the uh, ones I showed earlier, but where you now have these delta factors which making the lower bounds uh, weaker. And the question is, can we get upper bounds? Can we get algorithms which utilize a delta-related uh, setting and require less communication in, in a way which depends on this uh, delta. Yes? Isn't it surprising that the lower bound does not depend on M? Is it obvious or is it just like fact of life? Uh, well, I talked just about the uh, M equal to uh, uh, scenario. Um, yeah, if you talk about more, uh, then things become uh, a bit different. But, uh, it may, kind of matching upper and lower bounds may still depend on M. Yes, that could be. These bounds uh, do not depend on M, but yeah. In general, at least in this talk, I think of M, the number of machines, as being generally a constant. But uh, I agree that it's a good question to understand what happens when it's not. Um, so again, so for the delta-related setting, can we get algorithms for this? Uh, maybe a different way to think about this question. So when we have uh, a lot of data that we distribute between the machines, uh, and if we have concentration of measure effects, it means that the delta actually becomes smaller and smaller. So uh, in some sense, this is a situation where maybe by having more data, we can reduce the amount of uh, communication that our algorithm needs, because delta would become uh, smaller. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about one algorithm uh, which does have this kind of uh, nice dependence on uh, delta. There have been follow-ups to it uh, since that I'll briefly mention at the end. Um, so uh, the algorithm I'll talk about is called the Dane, short for Distributed Approximate Newton Type Method. Uh, for those of you who know um, the ADMM algorithm, the structure is very similar. So it's an iterative algorithm where each time each machine solves some local optimization problem of the following form. Uh, and then the machines communicate to each other average gradients and uh, average uh, solutions. So after solving uh, the local optimization problem, they compute the average. Um, so this is the entire algorithm. What is the intuition here? So uh, the crucial property is that this algorithm is essentially equivalent to doing an approximate Newton step. So what is a Newton step? Um, so if the problem is, uh, um, is sufficiently uh, smooth and we have Hessians, um, then one of the classical ways to do uh, optimization is to uh, iteratively do uh, something like uh, the following. Uh, this has a very fast uh, convergence, qu quadratic in general, uh, but we can't implement it here because it requires us to compute and invert Hessians. Um, and uh, as we said, actually computing and communicating Hessians is pretty expensive. Um, now, in our uh, uh, setting, an equivalent way to write the Hessian is as the average of the local Hessians. And what it turns out that, at least for quadratic functions, Dane is equivalent to do steps which are not of this form, not like a Newton step, but uh, of this form. So ignore the um, ui for now. Uh, here we have the average of the Hessians inverse, whereas here we have the average of the inverse, of the local Hessians. Uh, I should emphasize that the algorithm doesn't explicitly compute these Hessians. So even if the dimension is huge, you don't need to store d by d matrices. Rather, implicitly, by solving these local optimization problems and updating, this is essentially what you do. Yeah, but okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you, you said you don't solve the Newton step, but you solve like a full problem, which is harder, harder than the Newton step, no? No, because, um, okay, so I solve uh, this local problem. But this, may be hard. this can be like complex to do. Well, it depends. I do have regularization here, so I could do things like uh, SAG or SVRG or SDCA. Yeah, but you could, but solve, you could also <coughs> solve a Newton step by conjugate gradient with a fast algorithm as well. Yes, but to do conjugate gradient, you, the number of iterations you would need to do would either scale with the dimension or with square root of the condition number. So you can do that, but the number of communication rounds would scale with the condition number. So you don't get this improvement in terms of the number of communication rounds. Um, okay, so uh, this thing and this thing are not the same because we uh, invert the order of uh, the inverse and uh, the average. But uh, the point is that remember we're talking about a situation where these Hessians are similar. We're in the a delta related setting. If they were exactly the same, there would have been no difference between this term and this term. Uh, in the delta-related setting, they are, dif they are different, but just a little bit. And the difference is uh, quantified by this uh, delta, which allows us to uh, give a convergence uh, guarantee, uh, which is basically the following theorem. So the idea is that every, iter um, every iteration, we shrink the distance to the optimum by something which depends on uh, h tilde minus 1 and h. So h is the actual Hessian h tilde minus 1 is the average of the inverse uh, Hessians. So uh, again, if all of the local Hessians are exactly the same, h uh, is just the inverse of uh, h tilde minus 1, and their product would be just i. And then setting uh, eta to be 1, I actually get um, convergence with just uh, one iteration. Um, in the more realistic setting, where they're only delta uh, related, so this thing won't be exactly zero, but uh, rather something that would depend on delta and, uh, and lambda, the strong convexity parameter. And uh, overall, you get an algorithm where the number of communication rounds is logarithmic in the required accuracy epsilon. And 
depends on the square of delta over lambda. So if delta, for instance, is as small as lambda, it means that the number of communication rounds is just logarithmic in the accuracy and independent of uh, everything else. Um, just to give you an um, illustration of this algorithm, so this is on synthetic data, although we also did some experiments on real-world data. Uh, so here we compare Dane to maybe one of the most popular algorithms for this problem, namely ADMM. Uh, the left column is for four machines, the right column is for 16 machines, and the different lines correspond to a different amount of data which was randomly partitioned between the machines. Uh, so you can clearly see that uh, the Dane algorithm, as uh, each machine gets more and more data, the, relation, the relatedness of the uh, local functions uh, becomes uh, stronger, then delta shrinks, and indeed the number of communication rounds that you need uh, so here the x-axis is the number of communication rounds, this is log of the optimization. Um, so the number of communication rounds uh, decreases. Uh, in contrast, ADMM doesn't utilize rela relatedness between the local functions, so even if each machine gets more and more data, the convergence rate remains the same. Um, uh, now, the, uh, the guarantees I talked about are just for quadratic functions. We can also provide some guarantees for non-quadratic functions, but they are a bit weaker. I won't uh, discuss them. Um, and uh, uh, as I said earlier, there have been some follow-ups to this work since. So, for instance, uh, Yu Chen Zhang and Ling Xiao had this very nice paper last year where they proposed a different and somewhat more sophisticated algorithm called DISCO for the same uh, setting as ours, where they improve the dependence on the ratio between delta and lambda. So we had delta over lambda squared. They have just square root of delta uh, over lambda. Um, so, uh, so these are very nice uh, algorithms. Uh, one thing that should be kept in mind about them is that they're still not necessarily very, very cheap in terms of runtime because we still need to solve some local optimization problem uh, at every uh, round, which in practice is uh, a little bit uh, expensive. So in terms of the amount of communication, it's uh, generally small, but in terms of runtime, um, it uh, um, might not be the best uh, possible. Uh, another thing I should point out is that, uh, um, uh, so currently the kind of analysis that we have is either for quadratic functions, uh, for the algorithm of Zhang and Xiao, they were able to extend it to self-concordant uh, losses under some assumptions, also the uh, guarantees are slightly weaker. We still don't have an algorithm for the delta-related setting, which is, say, for a general, uh, strongly convex and uh, smooth uh, losses, at least one where you get a, a good dependence on delta. Yes. Uh, between this method and the one you just presented, yours, yeah. there's like a power of four, which is different. So you have square one there, you have the square. Uh, yes. What's what, uh, the gain of, uh, for example, what you're presenting over this one, if there's any? Uh, well, uh, in practice, the difference between them is not necessarily that uh, dramatic. Um, well, I'm talking about this algorithm because that's the algorithm you know I uh, worked on and gives a simple a way to take advantage of uh, the delta. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in many cases, that algorithm could work better. But I prefer to talk about my own work rather than someone else's work. Yeah. So do you think you, can, you, you could get away with like just smoothness and not separate Um Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good question. So the difficulty is that both in our algorithm and their algorithm, uh, it's uh, something very similar to quasi-Newton uh, methods. And to do the analysis correctly, um, you know, for, for any kind of uh, algorithm from the Newton family, it's very difficult to get something satisfactory without assuming something like self-concordance. Uh, in practice, I don't think it's really necessary in terms of you know, practical performance. Both these algorithms you can easily run on anything. But uh, the analysis, I don't know how to do. Are there like worst case scenarios where Newton does not converge on a smooth function? I have no clue, but... Uh, if it's non-smooth, you might not even have a Hessian. But for, let's like, uh, like a smooth, like, 
like the, mo the smooth function, but not, not more, mm -hmm. like I said, the squared in JOS. Mm -hmm. Can you show it does not converge in some situations? Or? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, actually. Um, in practice, it does work, but I don't know. I'm not sure if we know how to analyze it. So, uh, if we're the standard Newton algorithm, we don't know how to analyze it in this kind of distributed setting. It's only more difficult. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, moving to the last uh, scenario, I'll discuss uh, maybe the easiest in some case is when the data is in fact randomly partitioned between the uh, machines. Um, so again, this is a special case of the delta-related uh, setting where delta is something like one over square root the number of data points per machine. But uh, can we utilize the fact that it's a random partition to get even better results than in the delta-related setting? Um, so uh, just to translate uh, the results of the previous algorithm, uh, if we try to understand what is uh, kind of the regime where we can get a small number of communication rounds, something which is just logarithmic in the required accuracy, then the previous algorithms give you that as long as the strong convexity parameter is at least one over square root of n, uh, which is okay in many cases, but uh, not always because uh, again, this lambda, the strong convexity parameter, often comes from some explicit regularization that we add, and often uh, it decays with the number of uh, data points. Usually, in the literature, uh, what you see is something between 1 over square root the number of data points and 1 over the number of data points. So this gives us one extreme of this regime, but um, many times we do want to use smaller uh, regularization, and then um, the number of communication rounds is not as good. Uh, in contrast, in the random partition scenario, I'm going to discuss uh, actually a much simpler approach, uh, also in terms of the algorithm, that does allow you a log of 1 over epsilon communication rounds as long as lambda is 1 over n, at least up to a uh, log factors. So we get this nice uh, behavior in terms of communication for a much broader choice of the regularization parameter lambda. Uh, but to uh, explain this approach, I will need to take a detour and talk a bit about without replacement uh, sampling for stochastic gradient methods, after which we'll return back to the distributed um, setting. So we forget about the distributed uh, setting for now. We just want to look at the situation where we have some function, which is the average of many individual functions, uh, and we want to optimize it. So a very, very popular family of algorithms to do this is stochastic gradient methods. So if we do something like stochastic gradient descent or the subgradient method, what we basically do is that each time we sample one of these uh, functions fi, uh, we compute the gradient or subgradient at the current point. We take a step along that uh, uh, direction and project back to the domain if uh, needed. Um, now, the way that uh, the standard analysis works is when is assuming that these ITs, these indices, are sampled uniformly at random and independently from 1 to n. And that works because then each GT is an unbiased estimate for a gradient of the function I actually want to, estimate, uh, want to optimize, f of w. But uh, there is actually a certain theory practice discrepancy here. Because in practice, quite often, it's much better to do sampling not with replacement, but without replacement. So if I already sampled some index, I don't sample it again. A different way to think about it is that I uh, pick some permutation over the indices um, uniformly at random, and then just go over the data according uh, to that order. So I just do a random shuffle of the data and go over it. Um, and maybe I can uh, then reshuffle the data and go over it again. And uh, not only it works uh, better, uh, not only it often works better in practice, you get faster convergence, um, it's also uh, often uh, much uh, easier and faster to implement because uh, going over the data in sequential order because of uh, caching effects or if the data resides on uh, some uh, slow uh, device, it's much faster to go sequentially than uh, through random access. Um, now, intuitively, this uh, without replacement sampling works better because 
I am sort of forcing the algorithm to process all the data equally. If I sample with replacement, it only happens on average. But uh, it turned out to be very difficult to analyze these stochastic gradient methods um, when we do sampling in this way, because now the updates are correlated. I, don't, I no longer pick uh, the indices independently from everything before. Uh, there have been a little bit of work in, that, in this uh, direction. So uh, there are classical results for incremental gradient methods. So basically, ba uh, convergence bounds which work uh, no matter in which order I go over the data. But I'm not assuming any kind of randomness here, so the bounds are uh, much weaker. You can actually show that, uh, at least in some cases, they can be expon exponentially slower, slower than with replacement sampling. Uh, very recently, there was a very interesting work by uh, Gurbuz Balaban, Ozdaglar and Parillo, which tried to analyze stochastic gradient descent for strongly convex and smooth uh, problems, and showed that if you do sufficiently many passes over the data doing sampling without replacement, then eventually you do get a small error. So um, uh, as k gets larger, you get a decrease here, which is like 1 over k squared versus 1 over k in the width replacement setting. However, they also have a very strong dependence on the number of uh, data points. So uh, just uh, to make uh, the bounds here non-trivial, you need to do at least n passes over the data. If you want to be better than width replacement, k has to be something like n cubed. Um, and this is a little bit unsatisfactory because the, um, uh, the case where we want to use stochastic gradient methods to begin with is when we don't want to do many passes over the data. If you're willing to do many passes over the data, there are actually much better methods. So just do plain uh, gradient descent or accelerated gradient descent or fast uh, stochastic methods. Um, so in a situation where k is small or maybe even 1, these results uh, don't tell us much, unfortunately. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about next is some new results which give an analysis for stochastic gradient methods with, uh, without replacement sampling. Um, our goal is a little bit more modest in the sense that we won't show that uh, without replacement is uh, strictly better, but at least we show that it's not worse in a worst case sense. So again, considering scenarios like uh, uh, strongly convex and uh, smooth functions or convex functions, we get the same kind of uh, convergence rates as in the uh, with replacement uh, sampling uh, case. Um, so we uh, talk about various scenarios, either convex or lambda strongly convex and smooth, uh, and also an analysis for a no replacement version of the SVRG algorithm, which is the one that would relate later on to uh, distributed learning. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit how uh, this kind of analysis works. It basically uses ideas from stochastic optimization, but also from adversarial online learning and transductive learning theory. Um, so if you're not familiar with these, don't worry, I'll explain as we go along. Um, okay, so the simplest maybe to uh, explain is the situation where the functions are just convex and uh, uh, Lipschitz, each if I. And we look at an algorithm which sequentially processes these functions according to some random permutation, producing uh, iterates. And our goal is to prove that, in expectation, the average, uh, um, uh, the average uh, uh, suboptimality of the iterates is order of 1 over square root uh, of t. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, so based on this, you can argue that if you pick a single wt, where t is chosen uniformly at random, in expectation this will be the bound, or you can take the average of the w's. Uh, basically, this is what we, uh, this is the kind of convergence uh, bound that we would like. Um, and uh, actually, I'm not going to talk about a particular algorithm. All I would require is to have, that the algorithm will have a regret bound in the adversarial online learning setting. Uh, which is a situation where uh, these functions, I basically don't assume any kind of uh, statistical assumptions about them. They're arbitrary functions, and then, but maybe convex and Lipschitz, and then I want that the average loss of the points uh, wt that the algorithm produces is only 1 over square root of t worse 
than the average loss of any fixed point uh, w in my domain. So for instance, this, is, um, uh, this holds for stochastic gradient uh, descent, but also other algorithms. Um, and uh, the proof idea I can basically show in uh, two slides. Um, I think I, uh, not sure I'll have time to go over every uh, point, but this is the following. This is the thing that we want to bound. Um, I'm using the fact that uh, this uh, uh, sigma, this permutation, is cho chosen uniformly at random. So in expectation, uh, the marginal of f sigma t is just a uh, big F. Um, I add and subtract uh, terms. And uh, then I apply the regret bound that I assume. So this allows me to upper bound this whole thing by 1 over square root of t. Uh, this, the second term, I uh, write a little bit uh, uh, differently and do some uh, simple algebraic manipulations. And what I end up with is this uh, bound, where uh, what I have here is the expected difference between the average loss of Wt on the losses seen so far minus the average loss on the losses uh, that uh, still weren't seen. Uh, according to the uh, permutation, okay? And now I'm going to do something which uh, might appear to be very loose. So I upper bound uh, the expectation term by the expectation of the supremum over every possible point w in my domain. So why do I do this? Um, I do this because um, this kind of, uh, what basically I'm asking when I'm trying to bound uh, this expression is I had my data. I randomly partitioned it, fix some t. I randomly partitioned it to a, a, a group of size t minus 1 and a group of uh, the rest. And I ask for any given point w, how large can be the difference in the average loss between these two things? So because of concentration of measure and uniform convergence effect, this thing can generally be uh, small. And actually, this is exactly the term that has been studied in transductive learning theory. So in transductive learning, we have some fixed data set, which is split to a training set and a test set. And then you can ask, what is the difference between the uh, empirical risk of the training uh, uh, set versus the uh, risk or the average loss on the test set? And there's been an entire theory developed exactly for these things, in particular, um, can be shown that uh, you can upper bound this expectation of the supremum by a transductive version of Rademacher complexity, which is used to, um, like the yeah, so n, is n, okay, capital N is the number of the total number of data points, <coughs> and t is the number of iterations the algorithm uh, does. So you sample a single permutation and you do t steps. Yes. So here I'm assuming that t is uh, less than or equal to n. Uh, I do just one random shuffle of the data. Actually, everything I do here can be generalized to a situation where you do repeated reshufflings. But at the end, t we not the n. Yeah, so actually, this term would dominate this term. But that's okay, because I just want to end up with a bound which is like 1 over square root of t. But, but do you need t to be less than n, or at the end you get... No, it could, it could actually equal n. That's fine. So you could have a full sack, a full, uh, yes. a full uh, like a full pass. Yes, yes. Okay, so but you want to be marginal at all, so you allow, you're allowing for less than a full pass. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the analysis uh, allows me to do that. And Okay, so uh, this kind of expectation of Suprema, you can upper bound by a Rademacher complexity, uh, um, the Rademacher complexity of the uh, domain uh, W, and then you can apply, uh, uh, you can instantiate it for various cases. So maybe the simplest one is if we talk about linear predictors uh, with bounded norm and the uh, losses are convex and Lipschitz, we get the one over square root of T rate. And actually you can also show that all the, all the parameters hidden in the O notation, the norm of the predictors and the Lipschitz constant um, are all correct. You get the same thing as in the width replacement uh, case up to uh, maybe constants. Um, and uh, you can also uh, do the, a more sophisticated version of this analysis to get, say, the 1 over lambda t with lambda strong convexity. 
Here you do need to work harder because uh, uniform convergence doesn't give you one over t rates, but it turns out you can do some trick uh, to get around it. I won't have time to go into the details. Uh, but uh, to start getting back to the distributed setting, uh, I want to focus uh, on uh, the results for the SVRG algorithm, which is, uh, belongs to a family of algorithms uh, most of them developed over the um, past few years, including by members uh, in the audience here, um, which are exactly targeted at solving uh, optimization problems of the following uh, form. They have cheap stochastic iterations, like uh, stochastic gradient descent, but their convergence rate is linear. So to get epsilon accuracy, the number of iterations only scales logarithmically with uh, epsilon. And all the analyses I'm familiar with are uh, strongly used with replacement sampling. Um, and we instead consider a without replacement sampling and we picked in particular the SVRG algorithm. Um, so the algorithm, the standard with replacement version has the following uh, uh, form. It's a very simple algorithm. It goes in epochs. In each epoch we compute one full gradient, so the gradient with respect to um, the function we actually want to optimize. And then we do t uh, stochastic iterations where each time we pick one uh, individual uh, loss uniformly at random and do an update which has this form. In expectation, it still corresponds to the gradient of f, but uh, these terms here ensure that the variance, the noise that we have in this update, gets smaller and smaller uh, over time. Um, and the standard analysis is that basically you need to do log of 1 over epsilon epochs uh, overall. And in each epoch, the number of stochastic iterations needs to be at least uh, 1 over lambda. Uh, now, um, in a recent paper, uh, Jason Lee, Lin, and Ma made this very nice observation that actually you can take this algorithm and apply it basically as is for distributed uh, learning. So uh, in distributed learning, the individual functions fi are um, distributed across different machines, but still the machines can simulate this algorithm. So each time they do a communication round to compute the full gradient. And then uh, each machine runs these uh, cheap iterations on a subset of their uh, data. Um, now there is a, a, a difficulty here because uh, the algorithm requires with replacement sampling and we're talking about situation where the data was uh, partitioned at random. So it doesn't correspond to sampling with replacement, but at least as long as the number of iteration is one over, uh, sorry, this should be a square root of n, as long as you sample less than square root the total number of examples by the birthday paradox with and without replacement sampling is more or less uh, the same, so this thing would work. Um, so when I take this constraint and plug it into the analysis, it means that we get this way an algorithm for distributed uh, learning optimization. Uh, however, it's only applicable when the uh, strong convexity parameter is at least one over square root of n, which as we said earlier is uh, quite a bit restrictive. So what instead you can do is simply do the same uh, thing in the same algorithm, but this time use without replacement sampling, which fits much more with the random partition data that we uh, deal with. So it's exactly the same as in the previous slide, but instead of each time picking an individual loss uh, uh, independently, we fix some permutation over the data and uh, do the update according to this uh, permutation. And now this is something that I can actually simulate with random partition data all the way up to uh, a order of n, order of the number of data points in uh, t here. Again, maybe up to uh, log factors. Well, so yes. you do less than a single pass of the data? Yes, the, the point here is that I have these um, expensive gradient calculations which require a full pass on the data, but the number of stochastic iterations I need to do is actually less than uh, my, the size of my data. So that's... We had tried like, to do like a fixed random permutation and do several passes. Mm -hmm. It does diverge quickly. But the step size has to be much smaller. 
Yes, so um, I'm going to talk about the analysis uh, in a moment, but it's very important that if you do several passes over the data, you reshuffle the data each time. Otherwise, the analysis doesn't work. Um, but I think that this was also, uh, yeah, it, it was noticed that with these algorithms, if you don't uh, re-permute each time, it can either converge poorly or not at all. Um, Okay, is the basic idea of the algorithm clear? Okay, so this is an algorithm you can apply on uh, anything, but what can we say in terms of uh, rigorous guarantees? So currently we can give a bound for without replacement SVRG, uh, but only for uh, regularized uh, least uh, squares. Um, this is for technical reasons as far as I can uh, discern, but this is what we can currently do, still it's an important setting. So again, using the same kind of parameter choices, log one over epsilon epochs and one over lambda without replacement stochastic iterations, we get a similar kind of uh, uh, convergence rate as the width replacement uh, case. So what this means in the context of distributed uh, uh, optimization is that uh, at least for regularized least squares, we can, do, we can find an optimal solution um, Okay, there are actually two implications here. So for non-distributed optimization, it means that if we just want to do um, without replacement version of SVRG, we actually don't need to do any data reshuffling all the way up to lambda being around one over the uh, data size, uh, which again is good in situations where access to the data is expensive and doing this reshuffling is not something you want to do too many times. In the context of distributed optimization, again, where lambda is at least one over the data size, you get an epsilon optimal solution with randomly partitioned data, and you only need to do a logarithmic number of communication rounds. And uh, because of the structure of the algorithm, the runtime is actually dominated by um, this full gradient computation, which is fully parallelizable because each machine can just compute its own a gradient on its local data and only do an averaging at the end. So you, also in terms of runtime, you get a, a runtime speed up by using more machines. Yes. So in your first uh, application, mm -hmm. so you, you, you shuffled data once or it's just randomly and then you never change the permutation? For yeah, you just need to do it once. You do need to pass over the data several times, but you don't need to change the order. It's sequential passes. Because that seems to contradict the... I guess, I guess probably the log over 1 epsilon, the constant in front of it, has a n times worse term, probably. That's the slowdown that Francis is mentioning. Um, so like you need to much, much smaller step size. No, so actually... Again, the point is that here, when I say you don't do data reshuffling, it's because the number of stochastic iterations you do is not larger than the data size. You do more than one pass because you need in each epoch to compute uh, the full gradient. But to do the stochastic iterations, you don't touch a data point more than once. And that is important. Otherwise, I don't know how to give this kind of guarantee. In between two epochs, mm -hmm. do you need to change your permutation? No. So in this case, my guess, to reconcile with the fact that empirically when you don't change the permutation, mm -hmm. you need to use much smaller step size. So empirically, we were using like uh, SAG or whatever, which, or SAGA, which does not recompute the full gradient. So you recompute the full yes. gradient yeah, but at a given point. So it's like you start from scratch. And also, that's a good point. I mean, this is also an analysis for SVRG. I don't have an analysis at the moment for SAG or... SDCA and the structure of that algor of these algorithms is also different. So here I'm really utilizing the fact that this algorithm uses full gradient computations and a small number of stochastic uh, iterations. SAG or SDCA need to do, uh, they don't have a full exact gradient computation, instead they have more stochastic iterations. Um, uh, so that does break the uh, the analysis here, because it does require you in the stochastic phase to touch a data point more than once. Yes. Right. So if you don't reshuffle between the epochs, mm -hmm. that means that there are some data points which you never see in your stochastic iterations. But is that it? Yes, that is true. 
You see them in the full gradient computations. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I think this is okay. So this is more or less uh, at the end. So. To summarize, I talked about three scenarios in uh, um, distributed learning and optimization um, and gave all kinds of results in each of them. So maybe the one that we currently, I think, understand best, at least in terms of worst case guarantees, is the arbitrary partition uh, case, where maybe a bit disappointingly, the simplest baseline is also worst case uh, optimal. In the delta-related setting, the situation is that we can handle quadratic functions pretty well, maybe self-concordant losses, but we currently don't have a, a algorithms for, at least with provable guarantees for generic, say, uh, strongly convex and smooth uh, functions. And also the kind of algorithms that we have are a bit heavy. They need to actually solve an optimization problem at every iteration. Um, and finally, in the random partition, currently we have provable guarantees for least squares. The algorithm I presented based on the SVRG, I think, um, we still haven't experimented uh, on it too much, but I uh, suspect it would work generally on strongly convex and smooth functions, but we don't have an analysis for it at the moment. Um, well, okay, actually, it is possible to give some kind of analysis, but again, it's only a situation where Lambda is uh, very large, uh, so large that there's actually not a difference between with and without replacement, sa um, without replacement sampling. So maybe it's not a very interesting uh, result. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much.